this working here? There's a blindness that you've never heard about. Now these folks can see, just like you in almost every respect, the world looks just the same, shapes look just the same, but they're missing one crucial thing that we all take for granted. And we don't even realize they're blind like this, and even those having this kind of blindness usually don't realize that they have it. They're blind to their blindness. All right, so what kind of blindness could this possibly be? And it turns out there's a thing called health blindness. You're blind to the signs of health that the rest of us can see. And you might think, well, maybe I'm not very good at seeing health in others, but you are. You're much better than you ever realize, and we'll get into this in a minute. But it's not just you or me who are unrelated to health. It's also health workers. Some percentage of these, these folks, for example, are in fact, unbeknownst to them very often, unable to see the kinds of medical signs that the rest of us intuitively see without even thinking about it. All right. So this is, brings us to the title, Curing Health Blindness. Right. So how is this possible that there's such a thing as health blindness? And so to, to cover this topic, I'm gonna, in, in, sort of, we're going to detour into two different areas. We're going to talk about the fanciest technology in medicine and the origins of our senses. And each of these really are going to have to do with evolution. I'm an evolutionary biologist, really, at base. So let's first move to the fanciest technology in medicine. What is the fanciest technology in medicine? Well, if you had to think about it, you'd say it's the labs and the test tubes and the machines that go ping and all of the other kinds of things like you see in this room. But in reality, that's not the fanciest technology in medicine. The fanciest technology in medicine is actually our exquisite human senses, our eyes, our ears, our touch, the smell, it's good old-fashioned physical diagnosis. When a clinician is in front of a patient, they can use all of these natural, brilliant evolutionary gifts to judge the nature of the patient. We're, we're incredibly good at this. We've evolved to be good not at seeing dogs and not good at seeing squid. We've evolved to have senses that are incredibly good at seeing other people. And over our lifetime, we, we adapt to see what's the normal look of a person, what's the normal look of their skin, their hair, their eyes, the motor behavior as they move, the sound of their voice, the breathing sounds that they make. And so doctors become even better at this because this is their task. And so this is important because when there's a medical condition, when there's a disease, something breaks, something's wrong with the skin or the way they breathe, the way that their face moves. And so we become incredibly acute at seeing the slightest deviations from the baseline healthy condition. And this is the fanciest technology because it literally is, is, is orders of magnitude, billions of times more interestingly complex machinery than we have, than anything that humans have ever built. But we take it for granted because we can just do it. And we don't have to think about it. So regular physical, diag good old fashioned diagnosis of the clinician in front of a patient has been there since, since the beginning of medicine. And it's still to this day the most important part of, of medicine. It's just we don't think about it as a piece of equipment because you don't have to buy it. Okay? So it's always leveraged our amazing talents. And we're especially good at one particular kind of thing, and it's seeing blood. One of our most amazing abilities at health perception is seeing blood. And this is what allows us to, us to see veins, cyanosis, bruising, erythema, inflammation, pallor, rashes. We can see these things. And even of the top 500 most prevalent medical conditions, even today, 10% of them explicitly mention the pallor of the skin, the acute pallor of the skin. And of course, it's always been part, even since the Greeks, that the, the medical science would include these. But even today, with all of these fancy machines, we still explicitly mention this. Now, it turns out there's some of us who are blood blind. They don't see these kinds of pallor and, and blood changes, the right, blood gradients underneath the skin the way that the rest of us do. They're missing it. And the question is, why are they blood blind? But I'd say that's not the question. Your dog is blood blind. And I'll get this. Into the, all, the, all the other mammals besides some of us primates are blood blind. So the real question should be, actually, why are the rest of us so darn good at seeing blood? That's a little bit weird thing to be good at seeing, one might wonder. So let's detour to the evolution of our senses, and it is a discovery from mine that goes back to 2006, and it concerns the origins of color vision. All right, so let's back up. Your dog, your bunny rabbit, your horse, 
doesn't have color vision like we do. We say that it's colorblind. In reality, it has a grayscale axis. It can see black to white and all the grays in between. And it has a yellow-blue dimension, yellow and blue being opposites. In that two-dimensional space are all the colors that it can see. We primates evolved a third dimension. We have red-green, a new axis of oppositeness, reds and greens being opposite. So we have a, suddenly a third rich, a whole new dimension of, of richness that we can see that they can't see. And it's only some of us primates, not all the primates. And so it's been hypothesized that maybe for 100 years they thought, well, maybe we primates have this extra dimension of color vision for finding fruit in the forest or finding leaves, in the, edible leaves in the forest. One problem with this hypothesis is that the primates that have our kind of color vision are extremely varied in terms of the diets that they eat. And even in even one of these species, the kinds of diets that they tend to eat are extremely variable. And yet they all have the exact same kind of color vision. Another hypothesis is that it's not really for any good reason at all that we have this kind of color vision. It's just an accident. There was some mutation, and we got stuck with a new kind of cone in our eyes that gives us a new sensitivity. And one argument for this is that when you actually look at our cones, these are the things, the neurons at the back of your eye that are sensitive to different kinds of wavelengths. What you'd like, if you were a good engineer, is to sample, if, you have three, if you're only allowed to sample the spectrum in three spots, you'd want to sample at low wavelengths, medium wavelengths, and long wavelengths. That's what your camera does. It's a good idea. You want to sample uniformly. Birds and bees and reptiles and fish, who often have four dimensions of color, even beyond ours, they sample it uniformly across the spectrum. But if you look at ours, the new, the new cone that we have, this, the m and what split, it used to be just one, their, their maximum sensitivity wavelengths are in almost the same spot. They're sampling in, in, in the same part of the spectrum, which is a peculiar thing to do as an engineer. You know, nature as engineers doing something strange. Now, my own hypothesis was that it's not an accident. It's not for fruit or for leaves either. And I have a bunch of reasons I don't have time to go into here for, for the motivation for why I thought this. But it struck me that I had a feeling that color vision was for seeing this. It's for seeing the blushes and the blanches and the states on the skin. Now, we know that primates, everybody knows that primates show their colors on their skin. So gruesomely that, in fact, zoos will take this animal out of the zoo when it goes into the stage because it's just gruesome for humans to look at. So color signaling is part of our primate heritage. We blanch, we blush, and we can also see the states of health on the skin. So now, one argument, one of the pieces of evidence that this is in fact what color vision was selected for was this. It better be the case that the peculiarity that I mentioned about our kind of color vision actually is helpful at seeing these kinds of states. In order to see these kinds of states, you have to actually see the blood under the skin. The reason that these color, the, these, the skin is changing its color is undergirded by changes of blood under the semi-transparent skin. And in fact, one of the key dimensions that, skin is, that the blood under the skin is undergoing is changes in how oxygenated the hemoglobin of the blood is. Now, so if you want to be sensitive to the changes in hemoglobin, so just look at the red and the green ones in the middle. The red and the green ones in the middle, you see the green one is when it's low oxygenation, and then it gets this little W pattern in the middle when it goes to high oxygenation. It's a very subtle difference. And it turns out that if you want to see it and still see the way that, that mammals otherwise do, having, a low, uh, way, having the blue-yellow vision that we already have, constrained to see like mammals also see, but have this new ability to see oxygenation, you'd have to have one cone sensing in this little trough, the left part of the bottom of the W, and also at the peak of the middle of the W. That's the maximum place where you can suddenly see the oxygenation occurring. That's where you want to be when you work out what it should be. And in fact, that's where we find the M and L cones, which is what this new pair of cones that we have, instead of just one single one, is right there. So the peculiarity of our kind of primate color vision is in fact exactly explained by the hypothesis that it's optimized, color vision is optimized, to see these oxygenation modulations not to see the oxygenation modulation so much, but it's to see health and emotion and all the kinds of states that you can read off of another person or another primate from their bare skin. Another, hypo another prediction of this is that if color vision is really about seeing the states of the skin, then it better be the case that the primates with color vision are naked. Right? They have to have naked spots to see these color signals on. And so it turns out that that's true. The colorblind ones in the left column, for example, just a few examples, are furry-faced like your typical dog. 
The ones that have color vision have all these naked spots on their face, on their rump, on their chest, in some cases like us, pretty much naked all over. Nakedness, the evolution of nakedness, and color vision are the opposite sides of the same coin. Okay. So, in this light, the origins of color vision is really for detecting oxygenation variations, but not because we care about oxygenation variations per se, evolutionarily, but it's for seeing blood, which is what helps you sense emotions, and for sensing health. You also care about seeing the health of your loved ones, babies, you, seeing, you care about seeing their health. So, color blindness now. We haven't talked about color blindness. And by color blindness here, I mean red-green color deficiency. People who are weak in this red-green signal that we primates have, that the other mammals don't have, it puts into new light what color blindness means. They're actually oxygenation blind. Right? That's, that's what red-green color vision is for. It's for seeing this oxygenation signal and they're now deficient at it. They're handicapped at it. And so this health blindness that we've talked about before, sort of the inability to see health, they're the same thing. In fact, we've known since John Dalton, this is one of the originators of atomic theory, but also one of the original study, pe people that studied color blindness. And there's a quote from him, could scarcely distinguish mud from blood on his stockings. An optometrist. As a child, I did, could not understand what people meant when they said someone was blushing. They just can't see these things. And the same person, I had embarrassment when a patient complained of a red eye, but the offending side was not specified. He's embarrassed because he has to ask which eye is red, which is fairly embarrassing. And a, a surgeon, I had failed to see the extreme pallor of a woman waiting for surgery. Anyone could see it, the gynecologist said, but I could not. In fact, the patient was so, had so much pallor that the operation had to be delayed for a week while the patient received a blood transfusion. They really are, and there's a long history of colorblind folk noticing, noting their health blindness. And it's not just that colorblind people are blind any old kinds of colors. They're disproportionately handicapped at seeing these blood signals because that's what it's designed for. It's designed to match this blood signal, and when they're missing it, they're missing this blood signal. So soon after this discovery, Dr. Tim Barber and I of 2AI Labs, we worked together, we invented O2 AMP. We invented technology that helps amplify these oxygenation signals. And we developed a tech startup on this basis. And so we have a, a variety of technologies. We have one I was, uh, we were showing outside this one in the middle. This one actually kills perception of oxygenation, helping you see what it's like to be a health blind person, a color blind person. It also amplifies another kind of signal, which I won't get into. And then we developed two different kinds of technologies that work by different mechanisms that enhance the oxygenation signal that colorblind folk. And this, these, these enhance oxygenation for just anybody. This one on the right is sort of the next generation of protective eyewear. Anybody in the hospital that puts protective eyewear on might as well have this on because instead of just being clear, it keeps everything the same but enhances your, boosts your oxygenation signal. And this other one is a much more severe version, and it's not just because it's darker, it just works by a different mechanism. It, it radically enhances the oxygenation signal. And this is what colorblind doctors and colorblind folk um, also are interested, because again, they're not just colorblind, they're oxygenation blind. So our technology that radically enhances oxygenation is exactly what the health blind need to bring them back up to par, to help all those people that I labeled with yellow, all those clinical health workers that are in fact unbeknownst to them, health blind. This one. So just let me, let me give you just one quote from one of these colorblind doctors, a surgeon. I wanted to let you know how much I've enjoyed using your eyewear, especially the oxy-iso glasses. I now use them in all of my leg vein procedures. Being colorblind makes finding deeper reticular cutaneous veins a challenge, and the oxy-iso eyewear makes them much easier to see. I can't live without my O2 amps. So let me conclude here. By understanding the evolutionary origins and function of color, we were able to diagnose and fix health blindness. And one of the, it's not just any kind of color blindness technology. If you have a pull something off the shelf that claims to fix color blindness, well, they may help you see colors of flowers or ladybugs stronger, but unless they're designed to enhance the oxygenation signal, they're not enhancing the thing that red green vision is for in the first place. And they're in fact going to further obliterate the color deficient person's ability to see these oxygenation signals that it's about. And so one bigger moral of this as an evolutionary biologist who does mostly useless stuff, if you know any of my work, sort of useless, fun kind of stuff, evolutionary biology is also useful and important because only by understanding the design and function 
of our bodies, whether it's your wrinkly fingers or your forward-facing eyes or the shape of your brain, only by understanding these things can you build an engineering that melds with them and, and, and propels them to do something better. Thank you very much.